Hey y'all, Sandra Reed with Mossy Creek Mushrooms. And today, I am joined by my ever lovely assistant and boss, Samantha Reed. <laughs> boss. <laughs> oh shoot, I think I have you just slightly out of focus. Sit right there for a second. Right, row. That's scary. It's probably scarier to be there, in now focus. Now I can see the <laughs> sparkle in her eyes. <laughs> while you guys see the glint off my glasses. <laughs> for tonight... Is all about alliteration. Oh, no, I'm just playing. It's about lab work. How are you doing, Samantha? Doing all right. I'm excited. I got, I have a display in front of me that is quite fantastic. Sneak peek. <laughs> Bam. Uh, sneak peek over. All right. <laughs> so we actually do have a weird lab setup, as you guys can tell. Things are very cluttered on my desk right now. You can see the slants before you. What you can't see is under the slants is we have a little miniature uh, Nomad Flow Hood from Lab Rats. And uh, that's what I'll be using to work in front of tonight. Um, and then you can see right here, I have my overhead camera rig. So when I switch seats, you guys can see what my hands is doing. So, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm excited to be here, y'all. I don't, I don't know. I'm kind of at a loss as to what even to start with or to say. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> well, you could probably start with what you plan on working with, like what strains we're going to work with tonight. Well, we can, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we are working with uh, the one pictured there, there, sneak peek, sneak peek over. Um, that is a honey mushroom uh, brought about by spores. So we're going to talk about... Spores the agar. We're going to talk about agar to agar transfers. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, cl uh, cleaning up cultures, uh, how to do slants. Slants are super easy, so we won't spend much time on them. But slants are important because that's your long-term storage device. Uh, we'll be talking about, uh, well, I mean, that's really a lot for tonight, honestly, to do all of that. So we'll be, we'll be doing some spore work. Um, very simply, we'll be doing some simple agar work. Uh, just some basics. And then, of course, we welcome your questions as we go along. Um, I will be able to talk to you guys, answer anything. Samantha will be able to, to talk to you. And you can ask me questions that are on topic. Um, if you want to ask anything off topic, we ask that you kind of wait until uh, later on, if possible. So, Yeah, as always, we'll try to do a Q&A toward the end. Um, make sure we're available to answer anything. Yep, absolutely. Um, man, the chat's going good. Awesome. <laughs> glad, to go. glad we got some folks here. Yeah, I'm really enjoying seeing all the uh, the going back and forth. Absolutely. Oh no, you're glitching. Hey, it glitched for just a moment. It's it's done now. It seems like so. So we went through, and I promise we changed all the um, we changed all um, almost all the cords. We changed a a good few of them. Yeah. Some of them are yeah, just good measure, good maintenance. <laughs> Maybe. Well, and some of them I've had, like, contact issues um, where I went through and I started cleaning some of the interiors uh, just where, over time, I've had to, uh, where we'd connect them so many times they build up dust on the inside of the cameras and things like that. So we did a good cleaning. We're hoping that uh, we have everything going fairly smooth. So the glitch that we had there was just uh, um, digital there. All right, so um, we're also going to be working with some Hint of the Woods for the agar to agar transfers. I'm really excited about that because I really want to get this Hint of the Woods into grain. It's from the old growth forest, that trip that we took back in October. So um, that was actually really exciting. Samantha and I found, well, I guess we weren't the first people to find the Hint of the Woods, were we? No, we weren't. <laughs> Yeah, we were we were walking behind some folks. Actually, we take that back. We were walking ahead of some folks, and then we they passed us up on the trail as we were looking at other mushrooms. Um, and the next thing you know, we walk up there, and they've taken like a giant piece of hint of the woods and left just a small piece. And we're like, well, I guess we're cloning this small piece. So we took the some of the base off of it and brought it home. And it seems like a really fast grower so i'm hoping so and it was uh it was of course in the old growth forest which makes me excited just because those old growth forests are magical oh talk while i drink a water 
But yeah, it's you could you could tell that they did the um the good practice of leaving behind some of what they had found and then we were very considerate as well of just taking a small piece, just enough to be what we needed. But yeah, that was that was a beautiful trail and I would really like to go back and do a bit more videography. Probably like maybe this spring when there's a lot of um the flowers that are blooming, that would be really pretty. I, I have been wanting to for a while do some um uh nature documentary work. And so it'd be kinda cool to run up there during the spring, maybe each season, like during the snow would have been very interesting to get up there. In fact, uh that would be very interesting to get snowed in the mountains. <laughs> That might not be as fun as it sounds to me. Been there, done that. Well. And it it is if you're prepared. <laughs> well, that's what I was saying. Is like I would just go up there and go, okay, let's take a bunch of stuff to be prepared. I mean, I've got the tent and the wood stove. Um, yeah. And then just get up there and get some shots of uh, some nice snowy old growth forest. That would be magic. That would be magic. But it would be difficult because that trail already, I mean, I'm getting way healthier. And I probably could handle that trail better now than I did the last time we'd handled it. But boy, it kicked my ass the first time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, looking back, I think I put in 22,000 steps that day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, I, I'm it totally thinking <laughs> where it's mostly a gravel road most of the way up there. They just don't allow cars, but they allow horses and bikes and stuff. Totally thinking I'll just e-bike my way up. Now, I mean, you can't just, you know, ride it. I'll still have to pedal and do do a lot of the work, but at least it'll help some. So... <laughs> And honestly, if we're, not, you there. if we're not stopping every five seconds to bag mushrooms, GPS tag them, and do all that stuff, we probably had had that trip done a little bit earlier. So. Oh, yeah. Well, and that's the thing to keep in mind, too. Whenever you do day trips like this, you have to make sure you have enough daylight to be able to go and and have enough, you know, enough time to be able to bag everything up and document it and take photos and do the GPS tags and everything else and also be able to enjoy the scenery and I know 22,000 steps in the long haul as far as like a an, a multi-day hike is nothing but just to giving yourself six or seven hours in a day kind of thing to try to get it and a poor fella he lost his car keys oh and my gosh, I, I, I felt so guy. bad for him and we yep. even offered to like you know ride him over to the nearest hotel or whatever but it just, uh, yeah, so we were looking for car keys the whole way back, kind of taking a little bit slow, uh, making sure that we were kind of looking at the ground the entire time, <laughs> So, <laughs> on top of trying to hunt on the way back, too, so there was that, but, uh, yeah, adventures, <laughs> Oh yeah, <Absolutely. laughs> all the way around. <laughs> well, adventures are nice. That's actually, so, that is supposed to be, um, and I know we'll get to culture work in a little bit, but uh, that is supposed to be m the key point for my talk um coming up on the oklahoma mushroom festival is that my, i'm a keynote speaker and we're doing um talking on really it's on bioprospecting but he, he wants to talk about basically using this mushrooms bioprospecting the biking as a family like getting your family out there collecting mushrooms bringing them back to your lab and and doing that kind of thing as a as a way to get your family out and engaged with nature, but also to contribute to the scientific inqu inquiry and uh, also, you know, some cool badassery. If you guys want to, like, see my dream for bioprospecting, go watch the movie Prospect. <laughs> yeah. Samantha knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> one of my favorite one. freaking movies of all time is Prospect. There was some tragedy, though. Well, yeah. Uh, and uh, which made me in sad. like every movie, there's tragedy though. That's I the know. Whole point. <laughs> this, I in know. a story, something bad's gonna happen. So but like my so heart kind of called out, and I was just like, "Oh, dang!" It's true. You want those, you know? You want those happy exploration trips? Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, let's do some questions first before I get into this. Um, so, what have you got for us first? Um, <laughs> She's really just been, in, like, we've just been BSing. She's just happy to BS with me. I thought you said at the end. Well, we'll, we'll take some at the end, too. My bad. I, I meant while I was doing lab work. I, I apologize. I did see um, someone ask about uh, 
Soil and soil building. Would you be able to talk about soil and soil building? I mean, building? I, I can, actually. I want to do an entire episode on that, though. Um, and do not, uh, we're hoping to do an entire episode on you know, kind of the bees and stuff like that, too. Yeah. Uh, the soil building, I can talk a little bit about it, but, I mean, it's it's... You know, I don't really want to go into too much detail about it because it's such a big project and I'm so passionate about it. Big topic, I mean. And I'm really, really passionate about it, so I'm, I'm likely to go too far into it. But we we are preparing an episode for it a little closer to spring. Um, but I am get taking currently taking, like, shots to use for some B-roll in, in it. And, you know, to go back to have, like, a little three- or four-minute segment about certain aspects of it. But suffice to say... We're largely building our soil through the use of organic matter. And that organic matter comes right out of the grow room. So, you know, we're using our mushroom farm, the spent waste, to fill tubs. And those tubs, um, actually I just did a, uh, a uh, behind the scenes um, released on Patreon. Uh, oh, actually, no, I haven't clicked the button yet. That's about to be released on Patreon. It has to process the video first. Um, that's supposed to be coming out tomorrow, I guess. So, uh, that'll, on the Patreon, if you're, if you're a, a Patreon, a patron on Patreon, you'll get to see some behind the scenes of our tubbing, our garden tubbing already. But, uh, what we're doing is we're taking blocks and placing those in these black troughs, like the plastic troughs, like livestock troughs. And then, um, actually we're placing logs in the bottom and then the just spent substrate and letting it rot down. And then at the when spring comes and it's time to plant, um, we'll take our transplants, which, yep, right there, are a bunch of peppers and eggplants and things like that. Um, once we have all that stuff ready, we'll then cap off those tubs with last year's um, rotted down material, which is very dark, very black. And then we add a little bit of nitrogen sourcing from rabbit manure and rabbit pee and things like that. Um, they go into the tubs to, to replace some of the water solubles and things like that. So we're basically just trying to go through and build an organic matter kind of setup because we produce so much that it makes sense to use it uh, not as a waste product, but as a whole for you know arm of fertility for our farm. So. Well, and it's, it's useful to take the waste product of your farm and put it into production in such a way that it can benefit your crew, yourself, your family. Like, oftentimes we will cook for the crew, and we've got a crock pot in the office and um, just a small hot plate, and people can warm up their food for lunch or whatever. And it's kind of it's neat to be able to go out and grab some snack peppers or just whatever. It's well, cool. peppers are my favorite plant to grow. Yeah. So... I want to be good at growing tomatoes, but I'm not good at growing tomatoes, which is weird because this area is famous for its tomatoes. But I am really more of a pepper guy, and not even hot pepper. I don't even like hot peppers. Sweet peppers. Sweet peppers. In fact, this year I'm planning on making a fermented sweet pepper sauce just to see what it's like. Oh, so, man. I know. I'm excited. I like that one. <laughs> Well, think about it, like hope, all the deep, like the <laughs> deep, rich flavors of peppers just concentrated down into just a little sauce, and it's not. It doesn't have to be hot. We don't all have to be, you know, gluttons for punishment. So. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you guys know how envious I am of you or anyone else. Like anyone who can handle hot sauce and and handle it well, I am so envious. I want that ability so bad, but I have that that gene that just makes anything spicy. Three billion times spicier, so I'll be like crying and just Samantha's, sorry, snotting. Samantha's <laughs> uh, heat tolerance scale is like black pepper. <laughs> it's just black pepper. So it's, it's sad. I'm rather um, I'm rather embarrassed by it, but um, it is what it is. Asking if uh, I got any latipora samples uh, to do on oak logs. We got quite a few chicken of the woods of all types. So I haven't had them DNA tested, but I know that I've got some of those and some of the Cincinnatus. So, uh, Jacob, let's see, you're asking about the little boy poplar. How long do you incubate? What are your usual yields? So I incubate about six to eight weeks. Usual yields are, you know, I mean, actually, I don't know. It's been so long since I've done the little boy. From what I remember, it was a good pound 
pound and a half. Okay. Um, from what I remember. I was thinking we were getting around two, but. From what I remember, it um, it seemed to flush on two separate parts of the block, and you'd have like a pound, pound and a half on one, and then you'd have a flush kind of coming quickly in behind that one, and that would be like a pound. So just kind of, I don't remember two pounds just like in one big single thing, but maybe that was something Jackie and Tristan experienced that I didn't get to see <clears throat> at that time mm. when we were growing it a lot. Yeah. For sure. Because that's when you were breeding the fat man and... Yep. Um, we were growing out little boy for spore prints and... Yeah, uh, fat man is bred from... Um, what is it, a sword belt and... I can't remember the other... The everything mushrooms? Black poplar? I can't remember. Maybe, maybe it was... I don't know, I'll have to look at my notes, so... And that's another thing to keep in mind. Notes, notes, notes. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you guys. I'm, I'm starting to get really overwhelmed with how many cultures are being sent for the mycologium. Don't stop. I'm just organizing better now. <laughs> so, But, like, I've had to ask Samantha, because thankfully Samantha kept a bunch of notes uh, when people would send in cultures. And I'm like, Samantha, this thing I'm working with, who do I send this culture to back now that it's clean? How do I do this thing? What is this for? Yeah, I've been taking Who's pictures <laughs> of the of the package itself, so I, we can save the, your address, and then we can send a thank you card, and then the culture back to you cleaned up. Uh, so I've been taking a picture of that, and then taking a picture of the original, um, like opening the package inside the package, and then what it looks like in the bag. Um, and so there's that. Absolutely. Um, let's see. Just to kind of get through them real quick. Uh, Twenty thousand of the twenty-two are probably zigzagging for mushrooms. Uh, oh, hey, Catherine! Glad you were able to make it this time. And yeah, uh, green table, please. Um, if you've, uh, if I can get a copy of that chaga, I would love it. Um, we're definitely, you know, big string collectors for sure. I'll happily trade you something too. But. Uh, <laughs> You, uh, Donnie wants to know about breeding gourmets. Uh, Donnie, I'm actually about to go on spore streaks here in just a little bit, and that'll be the first part of it. So this is, when I go over spore streaks here in just a little bit, that'll be the easiest way to breed mushrooms, just hands down. So I'll definitely go over a little bit of mushroom breeding. Um, not the more advanced techniques tonight, but just the kind of basics. So. <laughs> and Chris said, is the cold keeping anyone else's mushrooms from breeding? Yeah, we so we've actually seen during this. We just had a huge snowstorm, and we, I think we ended well, up with been nine a inches. Weeks now. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> but I mean, it has it has like been it, it has been two weeks since the snowstorm. But the snow did last a little while, and we did seem to see the lag in the grow room of how cold it was. And it's, we we've seen mushrooms freeze on the block thaw out and continue growing oh, and yeah. we've we've seen this on multiple years but it was pretty it's just kind of neat to see but they will grow again <laughs> and some, yeah the, the cool weather some will yeah like everyone blue, i've seen them sure. all grow back and like well yeah, any of the temperate varieties but any I mean, yeah, pinks won't. not pink or gold yeah, yeah. if you're yeah. a cubensis farmer it probably won't you know that kind of thing but but i know that's not okay what we're, we're not you talking have about me fine no no i'm <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but, but yes, it's, it's, it's... It does slow it down. It'll slow it down and stall it out. And then, like Samantha said, when it warms back up. Like, my grow room right now is gross because I have spore sickles about that long um, from old mushrooms that I need to clean out that I have not gotten to yet. So... Yeah, we'll get in there and we'll get it done. Oh, yeah. Um, but in and, and those, those spore sickles, they, uh, they come so quickly. They so. do. And they're... Really fun to play with. You can wave your finger in front of them when they reach out to you. Yeah, it's like a magnetic draw. Yeah. <laughs> like a <laughs> Something to do with the ionic, the field, I guess. But the mushrooms end up, they, they are slower, but they're so meaty compared mm -hmm. to when they grow just super quick in the well, summertime. Cold, cold weather mushrooms are better quality mushrooms, but they take forever. And so that's been one of the things that we always have to, you know, eye of the needle, we have to thread being like... Cold is better for good quality mushrooms, but warmer grows them faster, so you get your ROI quicker. 
So, you know, you got to find a good middle ground, good area in the Venn diagram. And, and Brian, don't you worry, I will. I'll totally come over there and hunt Transylvania. If nothing else, then for the name, I mean, the Transylvanian oyster. Right? Like Vlad the Impaler. Oh, goodness. <laughs> uh. Hey, Nomad, I saw that, by the way. Thank you for, uh, for um, subscribing and supporting us. I will tell you... That now that you're on there, you should be able to see um, the posts I made today. But we're reworking our patron tiers. So, sorry, bud. I'm actually probably in a couple of days about to delete the tier you just went to. <laughs> so, I'm sorry for that. It's actually something that I've like really struggled with. Is I don't want to delete the tiers because you guys are supporting us so much through there that it actually makes a financial difference for us. But the these older tiers, or our tiers, we're not interested in as much in pushing up and getting fulfilling anymore because we've got other things that, that those things would be taking us from. Um, so we're wanting to do something like more like a subscription model. So, you know, the evolution pit, instead of trying to make spore syringes and stuff, I'm wanting to open up the Mycologium and do a patron tier called the Mycologium, which will just be, you know, basically oyster mushrooms, reishis, other uh, usable mushrooms like that that we have found through the bioprospecting that's been traded to us, etc. Um, for the Mycologium. And that is a way for people to directly support the Mycologium while at the same time getting something off menu from the website, something w weird and different, something from somewhere else. Um, and, you know, be able to get that once a month or so. And then another tier that we're wanting to do is called the Herisium Horde. And the Herisium Horde will be basically just the exact same tier as what I described, except it will focus entirely on Herisium. Because we have so many people really getting Herisiums, that, and we find so many throughout the year, that what I want to do is be able to, you know, if somebody supports us for one syringe a month, I want them to be able to get 12 new strains you know old growth forest from down in georgia or from down in you know new york or wherever uh in fact jacob wolves is apparently sending us in a nice herisium from mongolia so that's super exciting you know that'll that'll be added to the mycologium project so uh there's some really cool stuff coming down for, for the patron uh patreon but uh i'll be reworking those but I really do appreciate you subscribing, and I hope you resubscribe once I delete your posts. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and this makes it, um, it, it breaks it down into more bite-sized pieces, if that makes sense. And it gives people a, a bit more control over exactly what they would like. I know we've seen some people are geared more toward the Herisium side of things, whereas some people are seem to be geared more toward the, the oysters and so it, it, it definitely breaks it down to where you have a greater preference choice. So it's kind of a goal that we were shooting for. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Well, for now, um, you want to get into... Uh, I mean, it's almost like 30 minutes in, so we probably should just go ahead and get to the work since I've got a fair amount to do. Sure. And we'll trade well, places. No. <laughs> <laughs> Samantha's going to take the command chair here. <laughs> I'm so nervous. I'm afraid I'm going to... There's so many buttons over there, and I'm terrified to hit them all. <laughs> the stream, I won't be mad at you. We'll just get to get off work early tonight. Oh. Now I'm even more afraid to touch oh buttons. <laughs> get your ass over here. Which I'm a control freak anyway. <laughs> so. All right. Okay. Let's, we're going to trade up for a second, guys. Give us just a moment. Oh, goodness. Okay. So the two operable cameras are camera one and camera three. Um, camera two is you over there, so there's not much need for that. So camera um, two is me. One is Yes. One, one is there and three is over there. And three is the... Uh -oh. Okay. What? We don't have the chat. <gasps> um, Shame on you. You're going to need the chat because that's how you're going to read questions off to me while I'm working. Okay, we'll talk to people for a moment. I have full control. <laughs> you all should be terrified. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll get there, though. And I'll learn how to do this and be able to help out a little bit more. All right, get to you, too. 
get to YouTube. And pull us up. I'll have a chat over here with me, but I can't promise that I'll see anything. Okay. Very All good. right, folks. Will you guys let Samantha know if you can hear me or not? And if I'm coming in clear? <laughs> Marshall, thank you. Well, all of you, thank you for the encouragement. <laughs> Don't forget that there are uh, culture questions up higher as well, so don't be afraid to scroll around. You shouldn't have to change cameras too much. No, I can see you, and I can hear you just fine. Um, Hello, well, why is it I'm always on I-40 heading west, leaving Knox when you... Why are you constantly in Knoxville? <laughs> That's the better question. Oh. He might work there. Nobody works in Knoxville. Psh. They just live there. All right, y'all, so this, um, thank you. <laughs> Don't burn the place down, Sam. <laughs> no, Matt said, Sam, tell him to speak into the mic. <laughs> Why, get, am I not speaking loud enough? Okay. You get to hear it for once. <laughs> or is it, okay, <laughs> there we go. All right, here is some uh, honey mushroom. I'm going to give it a little spritz of alcohol. Just because this dish has been sitting around for a while. Um, my flow hood is that direction. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's my Iron Man. One of my employees bought that for me. Um, Tristan, uh, my former employees, who, you know, ended up becoming a f my friend. But he bought that for me before he left. Um, and because uh, he knows I like Iron Man. All right, well, my fingers are slick, so we're going to try all this. You need to go up a little bit. Huh? So you need to go up a little bit in order to be... There you go. Okay. I forgot that I had set the camera that far out. Man, this is, like, really baked on. All right. Now, this stuff is super cool to me. Because of these tentacles, we torch this. Nice sound effects. <laughs> Do what? I said the sound effects. Mm -hmm. So these tentacles are actually modified rhizomorphs. Um, this is the way the honey mushroom is called a meadow maker. Um, these tentacles right here. Let me cool that blade. These tentacles right here search out food sources, like tree roots. And when they find these tree roots, they wrap around them um, and then constrict. They swell up with water really hard. And when they swell up with water, they end up um, constricting the root and basically choking it out. And once it's choked out... Um, the it's dead and the honey mushroom can move in so i'm just gonna place that right there for the moment ah well i say as i can't place it there there we go they're very grabby i don't know if you guys can see that they're kind of fuzzy um and that fuzz is just more mycelium these rhizomorphs penetrate deep and then fill out a space so Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, tentacles. I appreciate it. Um, so, this is basically just an agar dish with, you can see, a piece transferred to it. Um, I've got mycelium growing out around here, and I've got the tentacles or the rhizomorphs growing out this direction. Um, there are also lots of rhizomorphs that you may not be able to see that are just under the surface. Um, well, if I hold this up to a light, it'll look a lot like a squid. So, in fact, I don't know. Does that do anything, Samantha? Yeah. Can you see through it? A little. You've got more like an ambient glow. What about that? That's better. Okay. Well, anyways. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, this, uh... 
these tentacles, um, rise morphs, you can place, you can cut up and move around. I've used those. That that works for anything that produces rhizos, like um, cubensis or anything else. Uh, the honey mushrooms are something that we just started playing with because I brought these about from Spore. So let's go to a, another dish and uh, let me clean my blades. First thing we'll do here, simple agar to agar transfer. I use these tri plates or these 60 mil plates that you see here. Now, what I'm going to do is I just clean that blade. I'm cooling it. And Samantha, can you see that bird of prey? Barely. Yep. I don't know if you guys can see that or not, but I've cut three places. Main line, right line, left line, and it makes kind of a the front of like a bird of prey or chicken foot or whatever you want to call it. Um, and I do this because when we place the transfer right down here, mycelium can grow and leap over these cuts much easier than bacteria can. So I've cut that. I'm now going to come over here and I'm going to cut into this chunk. Boy, that is hard. Oh, look at that. Those, oh, I'm going to have to cut those rhizos. You have ropes. <laughs> it's clinging onto everything and growing yeah, like through everything. Pull the whole dish out. So this is, I'm very unfamiliar with honey mushrooms, guys. I don't work with them very often. So we'll place that right in there. And there's one transfer done. Clean the blade. Rotate over. Chris said they're very spider looking. Yeah, they're crazy looking. They look like something from Stranger Things is what I hear a lot of the time. I agree with that. I'm going to cut those again. And I'm going to cut these short right here. And place them right here. Now, as the mycelium grows, like I said, it can leap over these, these little... Um, canyons that I've created but the bacteria can't which will slow the bacteria down and allow me to collect a clean sample from further out if I if it's needing to run from the bacteria I don't use any antibiotics in my agar I, I think antibiotics hide weak techniques yeah we always say the biggest tech or the best tech is technique. Yep. The best tech is no tech. The second best tech is technique. One more transfer, and I'm going to just collect these little rhizomorphs here. And then I'm going to leave the rest of the rhizomorphs that are embedded in the agar in this dish, close it back up, and see if they come back together or grow a new network. Alright, now I'm just going to set these aside um, and I'm going to take them and uh, wrap them in parafilm here a little bit later at the end of the show. So, that's that. Now, let's move on to, really quick, I'm going to just spritz off my little tool I've made here. This is my slant holder. And this would all be better on a wipeable stainless steel table, but we're just kind of popping it up in the podcast room on the, on the wooden table. Well, it was easier to set up in the studio than it was to set up to, in the lab, so. So. Okay, we'll take these. I'm going to pre-loosen them. Those are a little higher, Andrew. They're not quite as in focus. 
I'm not really that worried about it because I'll pull okay. them out. Um, they're not going to be the center of the show at the moment. Okay. Maybe next time we can get something like an Icarus board or uh, something that's a backlit. That way, whenever you put the plate on it, everybody can see more clearly. Yeah, that's that's a good idea. All right, this is the the old growth forest um, Grifola frondosa, which is the uh, hen of the woods, Maitake, um, as its Japanese name. And this is the one we found in the Albright Grove. Yep, that's where it says Albright on it. Now. Yeah, okay. Daniel, the one before was a honey mushroom. this again. Now, I'm going to take this and where this has got an angle to it, I'm going to put my, yeah, you hear that? Steamy. <laughs> Can you see it? Yeah. Good. So I'm just going to set that down there. Oh no. Oh. I'm not used to working in such a tight space. So I'm going to cut this. My talkie can get a little leathery after a while. So you might have to saw it up a little bit. Tiny little piece of tissue is all you need. And you just set it in right on that angle. Cut down and draw out. And then close it up. you put your finger on the inside of that lid? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> I may have been holding it between my fingers. Okay. But make cool don't do again. that, right? Next one. I'm going to have to hold one of these up to the um, microphone just so you can get that noise. Actually, I don't know if they're able to hear it in the headset. I can't tell if it's through the headset or if it's through where I'm right next to you. Normally, guys, I would not. This is kind of bad practice where I'm sticking my finger right here. I would normally not want to do that, but where I'm such in a small space and this dish is kind of wanting to slide around a little bit on this table, so, which is weird because it's not a slick surface at all. Um... I'm having to hold it in a way I wouldn't want to. Set that back in there, cut through, draw out, close up, and I'll set that on the end. <laughs> Tober said it's very sizzly. Do what? Tober said it's very sizzly, so he can hear it. Well, here, you're going to... And bad tentacles, yeah, that, that's a slant. That's basically what we use for a five to six year storage. Um, Chris has asked how many slants of each strain do we keep and how many total are we storing? So I have ideal and then I have reality. <laughs> so ideally, um, hold on one second. I oh, can see the smoke still or the fog coming out of it still. And yeah, all of these are open air transfers. Oftentimes, you know. No, we got the hood right there. Oh yeah. Well, you said open air transfer earlier. Did I? I thought you did. All right. Now what I will do? I'm not going to do it right now because it'll bore you guys. Well, I, I can I can wrap a couple just to show you. Is that we'll wrap the dish. And the slants. Um, someone asked about how many slants I keep of each strain. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, how many slants of each strain do you keep and how many total are you storing? Okay. So, the idea, and like I said, my ideal, is that I would like to sit down and make nine slants per strain. Um, and the reason for that is I would keep three on site here, 
So I always have a minimum of three, because they're at least kept on site. But I would have three on site here, and then three, um, you know, six more in sets of three that I would have. Uh, Go in frame. So no one like, can see it. Huh? Go in frame. No one can see it. You're in frame now. <laughs> oh. Well, I mean, if I'm. Okay, I'll try to be in frame better. Maybe if I move the dish. Also, anyways, someone's asked if we... So anyways, uh, what I was saying is that I would do three here, like three at uh, a friend's house and three at another friend's house. Or, um, you know, if you've got a farm, another farm that you work with. Man, this is such a weird angle for me to have to do this. But, um, and that way I would have nine. That way if my place burned down, I would still have six slants to work with. I mean, don't get me wrong, if this place starts burning down, I'm grabbing my culture library and I'm running. <laughs> um, kids first, culture library second. Um, so, that's what I would do, uh, speaking of, of, you know, how I would maintain. Uh, what were you saying, Samantha? Someone asked if we put wood sticks in our slants, so while you were wrapping that, I was going to see if you could just hold it to the side. I don't. A lot of times I'll put sawdust in the bottom, but I have found that these just big, thick, chunky agar slants, you don't really need a stick in them. I've, I mean, I've had slants that are three or four years old that still don't have all the food coloring consumed out of them. Because we're keeping them cold stored. They're basically going into stasis. But you have put uh, toothpicks and things previously i've seen i have um and i do that when i'm making um if i'm doing no pour i'll sometimes put wood in it because it's easier but when i make these slants are all poured using a uh, peristaltic pump so and you do that just so that there's consistency in the yeah, amount because i'm selling slants nowadays so there we go and, I don't know, if you guys are ever interested, I can make these in mass using my laser cutter. So if you guys are ever interested in, like, a branded, uh, I don't know, slant holder, let me know. Maybe I'll start manufacturing them and putting them on the website. Yeah, and Dalton, I mean, you're you're welcome to come take a for farm tour anytime. Uh, we're happy to give them. Alright, so, what I didn't show on the dish a moment ago, and I'm going to show right here on the slant. Uh, I'm right-handed, so how do I... So this is the Albright Grifola Frondosa. Today is day 39 of year 24. So that's this batch number. My symbol is my symbol. Uh, so that way people, anyone that works in the lab knows who did this. Um, and that's all I've got to put down for this right now. Um, if I had multiples from that same trip, because this is just the Albright trip, if I go back again, it'll be Albright 1, Grafola, Frondosa, whatever. If I find three of these, then I would do a three, uh, do a colon three, and that's how I code everything. Um, I mean, I can make it even much shorter, so. And we have lab notes where you'll do that date when you did the transfers, you know, You'll make notes of everything, and then if he transfers that slant over, he'll have the date that the slant was made on the new um, yeah, that's, labeling. that's a good point. So, let's say this dish says 3424, because that's when it was transferred. If I had made this slant from this dish, just underneath the name here, I would put this dish number right here. When we do liquid culture, we would put the liquid culture batch number wherever um when we do our call actually i have i have liquid culture here specifically just to do a quality control an lc test for you guys just so you can see what we do i mean we do lc testing on pretty much every batch of liquid culture that runs out of this facility <coughs> let me wrap a couple more dishes uh prada 
I prefer pouring with a peristaltic pump. Um, if I do not have a peristaltic pump or um, let's say I didn't have a, if I didn't have a flow hood, the no pour is the best way to go because you can just cook it all right in your pressure cooker, pull it out and it's all already sealed. Uh, and then you can open it up in your still air box, you know, and that way you don't have to pour in a still air box. But if you have a HEPA filter, pouring is my favorite. Um, I think every grower, cultivator, researcher, oh, sorry, anyone working with microbes should learn how to hand pour plates. But my goodness, it is so amazing once you've hand poured a bunch of plates to be able to use a peristaltic pump and just pump out like 200 slants in like 30 minutes. So, all right, now let's do an LC quality control test. This may be the easiest thing we do in our entire facility. So, you got questions for me, honey? Or? Yeah, there was a few. Um, how long do you let the slants colonize before cold storage? Uh, just until I can see that they're growing and that they are clean. As soon as I see that they're growing and clean, I will go ahead and just throw them right in the fridge. I don't have uh, any specific date or time because every species is different. And if I said, isn't the humongous fungus the largest living organism on Earth? Yep, the honey fungus is absolutely the largest and I think the oldest living organism on the planet. There may be a Joshua tree or something that's older. Um, but the honey mushroom mat that, oh my gosh, man, this actually is so thick. Is that the green elf That's cup? That's the green elf cup. <laughs> uh, that is like downright hairy. It's going to be sludge. That might be sludge. That's an air guys, bubble, we'll isn't it? I may have a hard time doing this, guys. I may have to grab another syringe. Hey, you'll this... stain the table. That'd be awesome. Well, we can try. <laughs> this is green elf cup. That's why it looks like mud. Um, it's not contaminated. It's not. Okay. Basically, when you do a, a liquid culture test... <laughs> oh, my gosh. You have to take the needle off. There is water squeezing out, but look at that. None of that's green. I'm going to have to take the needle off. Don't stab yourself like I did. <laughs> I grabbed the wrong syringe for this. <laughs> there we go. All right, let me try that again. So Marie's right. asked, oh, go ahead. So you hey. just do a little squirt, <laughs> a few little drops, a few little drops. You really don't need much more than a few drops. Um, now, let me show you what I should have shown you a second ago. This is called the pistol grip. So you take this <laughs> syringe and your needle and you hold it like this. You take these two fingers and you wrap them down here right here. And this holds everything on, and then you scoop. It's hard to do it right, and I'll allow you guys the light, but you're going to hold your hands like this with what's called a pistol grip. Take your two fingers and hold onto your hand. Take the needle cap, and then scoop it on to the needle and close it. When you take it off, you're going to do the same thing, where you take it off and it pulls, and you're going to unscoop it, right? Scoop it the other direction. That way, a lot of people, I've seen first-timers and whatnot, when they take this off, they want to just grab it and pull. And what they end up doing is it's got a click mechanism. Here, let me, you can hear it. There, there, and there. So what happens is when it clicks on and off, you'll pull, and a lot of people have this reaction of, oh, crap, and then they pull back. And when they do... They sometimes miss that cap, or they've got that cap off, and they stick themselves in the fingers. Um, and that's a real bad day. So, don't do that. <laughs> okay, so, now that we have the liquid culture in the dish, all we're going to do is we're going to wrap and label it. So, that what did you... Did you ask me a question and I answer it, or not answer it? 
I was going to ask you a question, but then I was like, you know what? I don't need to interrupt him. So. No, go ahead. Well, I thought your quick. pause was a pause and a good opportunity, and then you kept talking, so I wanted to be considerate. So sealed. You can probably see those little black flecks in there from the green elf cup. Now what you do is you just take it and gently shake it back and forth. You can get devices called a cell spreader, which look like a little hockey stick, and you can put them in there and, and spread your cells around. Um, they're really quite unnecessary for the most part. Um, usually you'll know if you need one, but you just kind of roll it around a little bit. Done. I'm going to take it and label it. GEC for Green Elf Cup. Day 3924. Andrew signed it. I'll put the batch number on here in a second. Yeah, each syringe that we produce, and I'm sure you've noticed if you ordered from us, has a lot number. And we'll do the LC test, and we'll oftentimes have the lot number of the syringe on the plate as well, so you can trace it back for the total traceability. Yep, yep. Um, I poked myself making LC of Cordyceps. <laughs> Last of Us premiered. Oh, I bet you they gave you a little scare. Though, good news is, we have really nice immune systems. Um, so hopefully, we, you know, the great thing about it is we're too hot for most of these things to survive. Um, 98.6 is a great temperature for keeping fungus away. Thank you, book Blight. There's a book called Blight that's all about fungal pathogens. That really t it talks about the thermal yeah. barrier for it's humans creepy. or for mammals, and that may be one of the reasons that mammals proliferated during the Great Dying is that uh, we have a thermal barrier and fungus doesn't like it, and fungus was killing everything else off. Plus, we've made alliances with bacteria and viruses in our gut biome to help take up space and fight um, against fungus. So fungus is actually quite deadly to fish. A lot of people know that ick, you know, you, they can get fish, uh, fungu fin fungus, and uh, reptiles can as well. Fungus is actually a really hard on a lot of other creatures on this planet, but mammals seem to have a better time of it. So, And that's really does seem to be mostly thermal regulation. There's a downside to it. We eat a lot of food. <laughs> <laughs> Marshall said no poke tech. But the question that I was going to ask you earlier was from Marie. And okay. she's, she said that she's in Jamaica. And would it be possible for her to get a honey strain? Uh, I don't know about the regulations of honey fungus um, as far as um, Jamaica goes. We ship anywhere that people want to buy. Um, but it is your responsibility to make sure that you are importing, uh, legal specimens. Um, and I mean, we'll check too before we ship, but, uh, honey mushrooms are probably legal. And therefore, as long as you guys don't have any regulations against importing fungus, you should be fine. Um, really should be quite okay. I know we had to show a... We do provide phytosanitary certificates for international shipments. But didn't we have to get a cert for hmm, the Bahamas, I think. Invasive species cert or something like that? Yes, we have gotten invasive species certification for uh, two different countries, both in the Caribbean for some reason. So this is salt oyster spores. It's, uh, Salt Oyster is from Jake Howard of the Mushroom Shop, LLC. So, if you guys want that, you should go check it out. It's quite an interesting phenotype for an oyster, hence why I kind of want to play with it. <clears throat> We're going to do a spore streak real quick. So those of you guys interested in mushroom breeding, you know, kind of perk up. This is what is called an inoculation loop. Um, I have a fancy one. Whenever I first started, I literally just took a piece of wood and a wire and bent the wire in a circle and then burned it into the, the shaft, and that was my inoculation loop for years. I've now purchased one, which is, what is it, titanium and nichrome, I think, um, and it has lasted a lot longer, but you really don't need the fancy tools. Um, you can just make your own tools a lot of times, but... It's very simple. It's going to be very similar um, to 
the transfers where we heat and clean, and then we're going to scoop into spores, and we're going to do a spore streak. Um, this will be a single spore, I mean a single uh, spore print um, breeding. So this is a single organism being bred to itself on this one. Um, but I will tell you, uh, after I'm done and wrapped up everything, we'll go into how you can um, breed with this technique with two different oysters. So, real quick. Flame sterilize, cool, and the agar. And now it's got a little bit of agar on it, it's glistening, it's a little sticky. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to grab some spores. And oh my gosh, I can I don't know if you guys can see the Samantha, can they see them? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a lot of spores. I probably won't have to do very many, I probably won't even have to scoop again. So we take it here, and then you start with big, wide scoops, and you go tight there at the bottom. Rotate your dish. Big, wide scoops. Rotate down the bottom. Oh. <laughs> Did you just catapult them? I uh, hit them a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to grab this big clump here. And I'm just going to go big, wide. Now, I'm going to leave you. That's a big cluster. I don't want to take that with me. Here we go. All right. I'm going to clean these spores off. appreciate you guys uh, being so kind to me while I'm making mistakes in such a tight space. Alright. Oh, some glitch. Oh, we're good. Okay. Well, so I will say, guys, I don't know if you notice how tight my uh, parafilm game is. Not to toot my own horn too much. But my parafilm game is on point. Now watch this. As soon as I say something, I'm going to be, <laughs> like, tearing it up. Don't frisbee it at my face, please. <laughs> uh, we had it one time, Jackie, when I was training him. He was always wondering how I'm able to get around twice on these big dishes. And uh, he was trying it, and I was having him stretch it out. And, man, he really power-loaded that dish and slung shot it where it hit one wall then bounced into another wall, and then hit me in the back of the head. <laughs> oh, he really put some power behind that one. <laughs> Looks like my, uh, Jake uses these grip dishes. I don't like the grip dishes as much. I like the slicks. So, but that's just a preference thing. Why use the grip dishes? Well, so you can get a grip on them. Well, no duh. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's that was a dumb question. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's, it's a personal preference thing. It's like, um, for instance, I use the number 11 blade there. Can you see that? Yeah. How about now? Go down. There you go. Okay. I like the number 11 blade. It's this real sharp angle, almost like a spear point. I like that because... It is both a spear and a cutting device. Um, this handle is a handle that's not very common in mycology unless you buy stuff from Paul Stamets. It's like his favorite scalpel handle or whatever. And it is the most comfortable I've come across. Um, I prefer this blade combination and this handle combination, not because of anything important or that anyone needs to follow, um, but just because it is comfortable in my hand and my cutting style. Some people like the what I call fish belly blades, which have got kind of a curved, kind of like what you think of when you think of a, of a scalpel, typically. So, Do the grip dishes stack better? Not, not really. Okay. They all have rims. It's just really there's a grip on the sides so that you can grip it better. But I don't really have a problem gripping dishes, and so I'm not that worried about it. All right, so this is a... Saw oyster, so I don't need to put it away just yet since you guys are I'm gonna show you how to breed. Saw um, Mushroom Shop LLC 3924 symbol and then because this is a spore streak, 
I do a symbol like that. Just the end of the inoculation loop. And that tells me, or Samantha, or whoever else, that that's a spore dish, a spore streak. So you start looking for spore germinating very quickly. Now, <clears throat> actually, man, I wish I had some paper here now. I do. Hey. <laughs> All right. So here's your dish. Right here. Let's just, we're just going to use a single compartment dish instead of the threes, just for simplicity's sake. When you do a spore streak, you do wide, and then you start doing like that. <clears throat> now, what I would do is, that's, spore, that's a spore streak, spore streak number one. I would then rotate my dish about 90 degrees. And do a spore streak number two. And then I would start that here. And I would just go like this. Like that. So that's spore streak number two. Now, what I would do is look for growth from these two different oysters. Um, and I would observe this growth every day. Anytime I see pretty much any growth, I'm going to transfer it out. Especially if it's an outlier, like if I see growth over here, right, I'm going to cut that out immediately, you know, just cut it out, because that's probably mold, and you want to get to it before it turns colors. But what I mean turns colors, I mean like... It gets green. It gets green or yellow, I don't know if you guys can see that. I'm going to open that up here in a minute. But Why? that's a mold. <laughs> because I ain't scared. Um, oh. <laughs> now, but what you're really looking for are these intersection points. So here, 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 there. Again, just anywhere that you see your lines intersect. And we could just keep going on and on and on, right? All the way down to here. Cut that out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these cut points, you can take and then put on a new dish and when that grows a lot of times what you'll see is you'll do your new transfer right so that's from a spore streak dish so that's spore streaks now what you're gonna see most likely is that you've picked up more than one colony and this colony grows like this and this colony grows like this and this colony grows like this I mean obviously that's not how it grows but you know what I mean and so you'll see these and then what you can do is now you can take cutout points of each of these and transfer those to a new dish once that's cleaned up you then take that to a bag of grain. Um, once you've got it to a bag of grain, you treat it just like normal. Um, and there you go. You trial that oyster out and see how you like it. Trial that one out. Trial that one out. A lot of what breeding and selective breeding programs is, is to just try over and over and over and over again until you get one that's an improvement. Most people don't realize. Most people think they'll be able to breed something unique and just bam, they've got something amazing. And that can be the case uh, with beginner's luck sometimes. But most people don't realize that in breeding, most crosses, most variations are not actually an improvement. A lot of times the variation is is just not an improvement. And therefore, you need to cull it. You need to pull it out, bring it out of your program. Because if it's not an improvement, it's a detraction. So That's like uh, yours. You did a, the BS series, right? And there were... A lot of those, from what I remember. Uh, we pulled something like 70 or 80 different strains out of the first blue snow cross I did. And we ended up with BS1, BS8. BS5 and BS8. Yeah. And the BS26 has been our most popular one. The one that we really liked. Yeah. You know. Well, BS26 and then BS5, because BS5 is uh, Mother of Pearl. Yeah. So. That's right. Um, 
Samantha, why don't you, on the left bottom there, it says sponsor. Guys, we're going to hit a sponsor real quick. Um, I'm going to get up and stretch for just a minute, and then I'll sit back down here and get back in the pilot chair. Clicky, click, click. Fun. Now I want to push all the buttons. <laughs> yeah, you see how I am. She gets mad at me every time I get in a car and I press all the buttons. Oh, because it's like windshield wipers and blinking and <laughs> like right. left and right like blinking things. All right, so here is an example of a spore streak of the honey mushrooms, and you can see a vague pattern. It kind of breaks down here when it gets a little bit quicker or it gets a little bit slower, but these are the honey mushrooms. Most of their mycelium is digging down deep. They don't really seem to like to cross out across the surface as much. But there's that. And then these are spore streaks. Can you see that, Samantha? Yes. Okay. Those are spore streaks. So this is a koji mold. Um, and I got this out just so I could show you guys what a mold looks like. Um, we'll, like I said, I'll um, open it up here and show you a little bit. But... This is a light koji, and I'm growing, I grow these out to uh, seed rice and then make koji kin. So, I also brought you guys a little bacteria to look at. And it smells amazing. It does actually smell really Not good. Not the bacteria, the koji. <laughs> the koji smells amazing. This bacteria smells amazing. Most of them don't, but. All right, so anyway, um, do we have a... Uh, questions I need to answer or I mean unless my chat is frozen Listen, so far everybody's been Lowell quiet and attentive Chris Kennedy. say what I see lol by Chris Kennedy at the bottom I don't see that you don't I think I might exit out and go back in yeah you might try that someone says I love the number 11 on a number 7 handle there you go yeah see everybody's got a preference big guy and a little coat that's exactly how I feel right now I'm learning what to do as well as what not to do. <laughs> uh, for cloning, I have trouble getting my needle biopsies to stay in the tip of my syringe. Any tips? Yes. Um, so here's this this uh, needle we were working with earlier. All right. Samantha, can you see the angle on that needle? Not really. You might have to go down. There you go. Okay. Can you see the hole? Yes. All right. When I turn that, and there's this angle here, a lot of people think of needle biopsies as a stab <laughs> and that they're getting something on the inside of that. Think, of, think about this, though. When they put a needle in your arm and they stab it in and pull back out, they're not bringing a, a core of flesh with them, typically, right? Um, and, in fact, a lot of times they leave the needle in there uh, for an IV or something. So... Obviously, when you're stabbing, it's not coring. What we want to do is turn this into a coring device. What you're going to do is you're going to take that hole and you're going to face it and angle it to where it's flush with the bottom. Uh, there, I've curved the needle at tip, actually. <laughs> um, but what you're going to do is you're going to take that in and instead of doing a stab... You're going to do a smush. You smush that flat piece all the way down to the bottom of the dish. And then what I do is I do a twist and a turn like that, and then lever up to pull my biopsy out. Um, was that clear, Samantha? I think so. Okay. So here's the flat. I'm going to try to do it sideways. So there's a smush, and then a twist, and a lever up, and a pull out. 
what you're trying to do there is do the smush to get a, a piece in, but then on the bottom of the dish, it's flat and against that bottom of the dish, that plastic. So when you try to pull it back out, you're having to break the suction of the agar. And the best way to do that is to lever it up by turning it so you kind of peel it off, right? And then you're able to lever out and extract it. So like smush, scoop, and lever. Yeah, lever. smush, twist, <laughs> scoop, and lever. Um, so I hope that answers your question. That's that's the easiest way i found to get it out of the... Um, <laughs> Michael Allison, smush and twist. <laughs> smush and twist, exactly. Um, that That is the easiest way. In fact, a lot of times when I do... Um, mentorships i'll literally get behind somebody and we'll do the pottery and the ghost thing you know where i like reach around grab their hands and then literally do it for them with their hands so they can kind of feel the actions because it's a very people want to people want to stab with that needle they just want to stab they can't get it out of their head to stab and we're not stabbing with the needle we're coring with the needle so Uh, let's see. I gotta make agar in the next 24 hours. Lots of transfers and backing up to do. Yes, I have a ton of transfers and backups. Do I have any experience with water storage as far as putting my ceiling wedges into stasis in water? I have seen so many people do this. One of the smartest people I know did this for about two years and had horrible results and almost lost his entire library and quit. So... I have not even messed with it. Are you done? Do you want to switch back? No, I've still got some stuff over here to do. Okay. Hopefully you're changing the camera angle so it's not just me being boring here talking. Uh, no. <laughs> no? You're, you're, you Okay, should... well, let's talk about cleaning up dishes then a little bit. <laughs> Here's one of my favorite ways to do it. This is our Cumberland Oyster. Um... This is an older dish. You can see it was done on day 336 of the year 22. So this is quite old. Um, but I left it around as an example that I can show people. So I actually don't even mind if we open it up. Um, boy, it smells good. So this is just sawdust. It's just sterilized sawdust. Basically, I put sawdust pellets in here. I wet them, close it up, pressure cook the whole dish. And now, you know, I have a, a dish here for cleanups, just ready to go. I keep them stacked up and ready. And then what you can do is you'll take your, your sample and you'll place your sample on one side and then let it grow. You know, close it up, let it grow, and then make sure you mark which side you put it on, please. Because <laughs> once it grows all the way across, you know, you may not, that wedge may be out of water, may be shriveled up, you may not see it anymore. But once it's grown fully across, you can then come over here and just scoop some of that um, myceliated sawdust out and put it back on a plate. I mean, it's so, so simple. Sawdust does not harbor bacteria very well. And most of what we work with works really, really well. It's white rot fungus. It's made to rot down wood and lignus substrates. And so that ends up being a self, what they call a self-selective substrate. The substrate selects what will go on it without even having to do... I mean, you still you should sterilize it because molds and other funguses can grow on it. But, you know, you're, you're selecting out for most of the other dangerous stuff, which is bacterial. And even if you have a bacterial sample, sometimes you can throw it in there, roll it around on the, the one side of the, the dish and the sawdust and have it grow through and it's cleaned up. Uh, yes, uh, Toba Red, if um, warm weather strains like pink oysters will die in cold storage, um, so will things like cubensis, anything tropical, milky mushrooms, that kind of stuff will. So. Say that, honey? Yeah. What are we doing? Do you have more? Do you want me to ask questions? You can ask questions um, already. Hey, the button worked. Okay, so. How, Jake has asked, how do you trial out some of your wild genetics that take a long time, such as hens? Is there a way to fasten the process for checking 
Pass in the process for checking for commercial viability. The basically, no. You're just going to have to to go with it. You're just going to have to go at the, the pace that it goes. You can speed things up a little bit by going to like a five pound dish, or five pound dish, a five pound bag versus a 12 pound bag. The 12 pound bags are going to take longer. Uh, the ratio in our five pound bags grows in much faster than the ratio in our 12 pound bags. Just doesn't support as large of a flush is all. Um, but then again, you know, I, I just feel like it's best to test everything at my standard, which is a 12 pound bag. Uh, this right here is a bacterial swab or streak where I went through and just did, you know, the same zigzag. I did it a little tighter than I should have. Smells like, uh, kind of beery, <coughs> sour, blackberry kind of smell. Say? But that is these little, these are basically yeast colonies. In fact, you can see a little bit of like the mycelia coming off the edges. Because yeast will make a short chain mycelium. So you have that. And then. Uh, well, I sneeze as soon as you open that up. <laughs> well, I don't think that was because of this, but maybe. <laughs> I know I was trying to keep from sneezing in the lab earlier when I was spore printing mushrooms. I ended up like having to run out of the lab and sneeze 15 times. It happens. This, is, this one I'll close back up fairly quick since we've been working with stuff. So everybody get a good look at it now. That is mold. That is koji mold. Screenshot. <laughs> it is one of the most beautiful organisms on this freaking planet. And one of the most useful. Oh my god, that smells so good. Like, my mouth is watering. <laughs> it does smell very, um, kind of floral, fruity. Yeah, it's like flowery, fruity, fermenty. It hits you, you know, right in the jaw. And you just, your mouth starts watering. Andrew's been brewing with it, and he made something that I thought would smell absolutely amazing. And it didn't to me. And then he had me sniff what he had made with the koji mold, and it was very, it was lovely. <laughs> and I was like, like, it's funny that the one that I like the smell of the most is mold. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, the one you didn't like was the apple cider I was brewing. Um, and that apple cider really had kind of a sulfurous fart smell to it. <laughs> um, and I had somebody tell me that it was yeast running out of nutrients or something like that. And it might have been, I'm not sure. But it definitely had a sulfur bedeviled smell. Bedeviled. And, uh, huh? I said bedeviled. Bedeviled. Because <laughs> um, of sulfur. Uh, but, uh. And then, yeah, the one thing, the thing that we make with mold, the moldy food ends up smelling amazing. So, <clears throat> I have a spiced sake going right now that just, oh my gosh, I'm blowing my mind with how good it smells. Um, okay, so, these are called, these are swabs, just cotton-tipped wood applicators. You can buy them sterile or non-sterile. I get them sterile. Um... This is another good way. If you don't want to use an inoculation loop, you can use these to uh, do your spore streaks. I also use these to collect samples of molds and things, and then you can just uh, put them in a slant without without anything in it. Put it in there, break it off, and then you've got swabs of contaminants or anything else that you can send off for DNA testing. Um, you can grow it out yourself. You can take it and then rub the spores on a slide and check out a microscope for those of you that like to do your own contamination identification but these things are super handy to have on hand um, I throw like a pack of 200 in my truck a pack of 200 in my bike a pack of 200 in the lab I just I have these things everywhere because they're super cheap and they're super useful um, if you're ever in the field you can just take them get the uh, swabs and then just close these back up and you, you know, do whatever you need to with them in the lab. But I have a box. It's called Andrew's Death Box. It's actually called Andrew's Death Docs because for some reason I put a D O X instead of a B O X and then I had to change it. And Ben noticed, and now Ben, you know, Ben doesn't let anything go. So, <laughs> uh, but it's my containment. It's got a big skull and crossbones on it. And it's in a box inside of a box under a table. 
so that nobody messes with it but me. Um, because Samantha really hates that I collect contaminants for a hobby. I... <laughs> you better be showing yourself while you're talking. <laughs> Push the one button. <laughs> I don't hate it. I just don't particularly like it. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think uh, I think there's there should be an entire room dedicated to just contaminating things, and it should have biohazard signs everywhere. <laughs> anyway, uh, now I can't see your face. It's just this screw. Um, Undone says I was talking about when I, I biopsy flesh of the mushroom to put in the dish, not from the dish. Same technique. Yeah, it's roughly the same thing. You still want to do like a more of a smush, so. Um, I guess that's really all I've got here at the moment, so I can switch back with you now. Okay. Camera on me. <laughs> I don't mind. The public comes here to see me anyways. They like me for my body. Mm. All right, I'm back. Wow, it is so weird now being able to hear myself. <laughs> All right, so we're now taking questions. Want to make sure I didn't miss any either here. Um, out of one cross, how many individual strains do you trial out? As hundreds would be impossible to try out, how do you select for vigor? Just the fastest one. So, yeah, what I do is I select for the largest colonies typically. Um, I have a couple of rules in my breeding program. I don't pick the slowest things. I also limit myself to three to five picks from a cross. So I no longer really just collect dozens and dozens of strains. It's just impossible to keep up with. So I, and that I'll do a, a cross tw you know, multiple times. So, cause you never know what you're getting. It's a, it's a whole lottery, but, um, yeah, that's that's basically what I do is three to five strains per cross, and then I select for the ones that are the most aggressive. Because to me, in my breeding program, performance comes first, and uniqueness comes second. So what I want are strains that are not garbage, that are unique. And so that might be... I don't know, I might be missing something really, really cool by not picking the slowest growing one, but if it's the slowest growing one, who really is going to want that cool thing? Nobody. I wouldn't want to grow it to try to make a profit with it. Maybe if I was doing it just for a hobby, that kind of thing. But even then, people like results. So we kind of breed for speed, aggression. Um, if it's going to have an immune system capable of fighting off its brethren, it's going to have an immune system capable of fighting off contamination. So... Uh, that's, that's a couple of things I pick for in my breeding program. You find anything, Samantha? Pretty's asking, how do you verify that it's a successful cross between the two different subspecies? Um, so, you don't. It's a numbers game. Um, the question is, why does it matter if you got an improved strain that it was a verified cross, number one. Number two, um, you can see a lot of times if it's a verified cross. like, Or maybe not verified, you can see a lot of times if it's a true cross. Like, you'll see, um, we have a couple of strains that are derived from Mother of Pearl that absolutely do not look like Mother of Pearl, except that in the way they fruit, which is they come out and ev caps are facing every direction. Like, like Mother of Pearl doesn't know which way is up. Well, we'll see that in other strains. We'll, you'll see combined traits. And as you learn your babies, you'll start to learn the traits of these things. They'll pass on from generation to generation. Um, and you'll kind of you'll, you'll get an idea. It, it, another thing is to pick a selection. Um, tr a, a trait that you can confirm. So... They do this with genetic engineering a lot of times. Um, they'll go, we're trying to figure out how to genetically engineer this species to do this thing. So to prove our concept, let's first breed glow in the, or not breed, let's first get a glow in the dark gene in it, right? So there's a guy doing this with dogs. 
Um, there's a documentary called Unnatural Selection. I think it's on Netflix. Um, Joe Zayner, who was Josiah Zayner um, of the Odin Project, is in it, and a few other people. Um, and they are like the guy that was working on dogs. He's wanting to help with uh, genetic engineering the bad traits out, right? The, you know, we've bred these breeds of dogs. They're awesome breeds, but we want hip dysplasia gone. So, you know, he's p- kind of playing around with that stuff. But the idea behind this is, okay, let's put the glow-in-the-dark bioluminescence in first. And we'll see, even down to the sperm and egg level, if they're glow-in-the-dark sperm, right, they're carrying the gene. And then they'll take that to the dogs and then... Okay, if the dogs have a bioluminescence to them, um, I mean, it's not going to help the dogs. It's not going to be something you can see unless you're in total darkness. Um, But it would confirm the transference of the gene. So that's kind of what you do when you're breeding is you'll go, I'm going to breed a blue to a white. That's why the BS series was my first series and why it's my most popular. It's my most popular because it's my first release. Um but that blue that blue snow cross um, allowed me to get a several different shades of blue. I got to confirm that either the blue the color genes or the dilution genes were being transferred over to other strains. So, oh, what you got there? Those are king. Those are some kings with some crowns. Yeah, so we had um, a block provider. We had made a bunch of kings, and we had a block provider that we were going to send them to, but they had... You mean a, a block client? Uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, a block right. client. <laughs> but as the as the block provider, we, we try to do some really neat, reliable strains, and then um, the block client had had a poor experience with kings from another provider, and so we ended up not sending them, but we kept them for ourselves, and... Um, they're humongous, but the reason why I went to you're grab you, these... They're blurry. Pull them. Your right face there. is where the... Right there. They look beautiful there. Beautiful there? Okay. But now we can't hear you. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> is that good? She's like, I don't know what to do with my hands. What is that from... <laughs> so the box of gloves, which we're going to eat these, so it doesn't matter. The box of gloves, there was only one left. So this is this is all one cluster, by the way. But the reason why I went to pick these is um, how many different king oysters have you tried? And uh, Undone had asked. And I recently did a taste test between medium and mini kings. Do you like any of the smaller kings? Um, they are great smoked. And we just did a deer roast with <laughs> all these kings that have come in. It's insane. Yeah, we got a I fill, I king filled up, coming in <laughs> I filled up a whole crock pot full <laughs> Of these just and the deer tears. roast and mushrooms yeah. <laughs> and the onions, but it's um and and we have had a little bit of uh our humidity was super high, so these are a bit warty on top, but they're still good. <laughs> anyway, these I just really like them. Yeah, king oysters are one of my favorites, especially to eat. The texture is phenomenal. Uh, somebody asked about kings. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, undone okay. did. Um. Uh, Okay, um, as far as king is go, I've trialed about five or six strains. Uh, a few years ago, there was um, <coughs> there was a whole lot of talk about people, everybody was getting blotch in king oysters. And everyone was, was talking about it was this, or it was this, or it was this, and I was sitting there going, man, why are we all having this? Like, we all can't have the same level of dirtiness in our grow room. We can't have all the same problems in our humidifier are we all keeping our where none of us have our settings the same why are we all facing this and i realized we were all buying the kong strain from north Spore. i think like main cabin stem carries it now north Spore carries it it's a really good strain it's a fantastic strain it's productive it produces really good mushrooms but there was something about it across the country i felt like that everybody was getting blotch and I couldn't explain why exactly. And then I started thinking maybe there's there's a couple of things. Either one, the the supply chain is contaminated, um, or B, um, there was just something about the climate. 
every time, you know, every year we have a new surge in microbiota um, that just blossom, right? And then something's going to have the advantage. And I just felt like something climate-wise, like overall climate-wise, there was just a, a stronger strain of bacteria going around um, that Kong was weak too. And so we ended up trialing a bunch of different king oysters out, um, and ours ended up being the the one that we really prefer. That nowadays we prefer it now. Um, it, well, that strain will make if I, if we make a really big hole, it'll make those big kings. But what I really like is to make a smaller hole so that we get a king that's as large as my forearm and the cap is big around as my hand. Um, it's like a two to three pound mushroom. Yeah, and that, that's actually like, why that cluster ended up being so large is because I had made our normal hinge cut. And so we ended up with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And these these are a good size. Um, oh, it's, yeah. it's nothing to you know sneeze at. No. But if you make a smaller cut, you're going to get... L- Bigger mushrooms. Larger, maybe one or two. Yeah. Uh, maybe even three. Yeah, and I definitely have my humidity way too high. I was not expecting to grow kings. So I was really socking the fog to my room, and now I've got those crowns on the top of my kings right now. But um, So you even had people back then spraying bleach on their mushrooms to hide the, the bacterial stain, like the... the the ble- the bacteria would stain the stems brown, and he was, I mean, straight up just spraying bleach on his mushrooms, <laughs> like to hide it, um, to I guess to kill the bacteria or something like that. It was food safe, like it was five percent bleach, which we're allowed to wash vegetables in. But I just was like, man, I cannot imagine spraying bleach on mushrooms where they absorb everything, um, but also just to hide the bacteria. That's not really what it's about. It should be about disinfecting. Um, but you're not going to disinfect a mushroom. It's porous. Uh, a ble- bleach spray is not going to do that. So uh, the guy actually ended up switching to maitake, I think, because he can keep his rooms drier, and it allows him to grow he can grow maitake better than king, which is another good example of you should move to what you're good at and what your room's really good at. But um, well, it could be environmental, too, whatever state you're in, yeah. um, depending on your natural environment can oftentimes inf- uh, affect your... Yeah, it affects your grow room big time, for sure. Um, Absolutely. And what we did was we grew out five different king strains. Um, This one and one other really performed super well in the blotch test. Kong blotched out almost immediately. And then another strain really blotched out as well. Uh, And then we had three strains that really survived one just kind of barely survived this one um grew out really really well so our king strain and then the king strain from um oh man it's probably been five years since i've done this test i can't remember um it'll be in my notes somewhere but we ended up having uh, some real winners and then this one was the one we settled on just because we like the larger kings the chefs can get smaller kings from like asian markets and food distributors so we went with the king that they couldn't get somewhere else something giant and you know the scrimmier kind of mushrooms and i i really like i really like the caps on these too i noticed whenever i was cutting them uh, and slicing them through to put them in in our meal and oftentimes i mean we eat mushrooms quite a bit but it just had a really i almost want to go get a knife and just cut it in half but it has like a mottled effect to it just it's just really pretty and it has a good texture kind of marbled looking yeah, yeah. You, don't, you don't have your knife on you do you uh no i took it to hey, right there oh Is i do it? actually Da-da-da. you're welcome this is a gorgeous knife by the way the... it is a gorgeous knife that fan sent that to me a fan of the show um and he made that knife himself and did the leather working himself and just just such a cool gift. I get so many cool gifts from you guys. She's not happy with that one. I think it was like the enormous one. Uh, where did you see that king question? Because I might, or my chat must be. Uh, is it near the bottom? 
I did skip ahead a little bit. I was getting prepped for it, and then whenever I came in here, <laughs> you, uh, but no, uh, Christoph had a question right before it that said, do you also start from spores at some point to completely restart, or do you buy new agar to restart? Yeah, see, I'm not seeing that anywhere. Really? Yeah. What's up with that? I don't know. Maybe you reset my chat real quick. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Jacob Wolves, how many strains of pinks do you have at the moment? What's the bottom one I've got? So, a lot. <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding. Uh, okay, so I see Kristoff here. Do you also start from spores at some point to completely restart, or do you buy new agar to restart? So, I mean, Kristoff, I do slants uh, anytime I get anything in, so I don't have to get it again. But um, if I had to, I would just rebuy the strain. If you're going from spores, you're getting something new. Spores are filial generations. It means they're sexual, which means there's a mix of DNA. And cloning is a clonal generation, which means you're getting the exact same set of DNA. So if you want your strain back, you need to always go back to the freshest place you can get it. That's either a purchase or a slant or whatever. Uh, spores are good for getting the genetics, but you're not getting the exact strain, not that exact mix. So... And if you take the same genes and mix them up in a different way, you can end up with a completely different creature. So, what? Huh? What? You're over there smelling your hands. <laughs> it smelled good. <laughs> you didn't catch me doing that, did no, you? No, <laughs> I didn't, but I, I tried to. <laughs> All right, did you get a cut that you wanted? No, I don't think they're big enough. Okay. Um, and and then that was the largest cluster that we had, but they could have grown larger. And yesterday I ended up picking the absolute largest kings that we had. But yeah, it definitely doesn't have it. So it is what it is. It'll be all right. You have to hold it up close to your face for people to be able to see. There you go. Ta da! <laughs> uh, let's see. Nomad said, just checked out that book, Unnatural Selection, by your recommendation. Really awesome illustrations. I agree. I love that book. It is so cool. All the, uh, In fact, I'm glad you reminded me that book exists, because I hadn't even finished it yet, and I put it back on the bookshelf and need to get it back off, because that book is amazing. Catherine says, my Petri dishes have like a yellowish blob on them. I've been throwing them away thinking they are contaminated. Do you think I'm correct? It depends on what the yellowish blob is. I... Uh, if it's just liquid, it could be metabolite. But if you've got these, if it looks like a grease spot, like a greasy bit of fat, like on top of a soup or something like that, that's usually yeast. Yeast is very greasy, fatty looking. So, um, I pick old brown and white oysters, pretty tangy. Well, yeah, I I absolutely love. In fact, that's what I'm looking at doing right now is this weekend where we have so many king oysters coming in. What I'm wanting to do is slice them up like French fry style. Um, and then just throw them in jars and then use the big autoclave we've got to pressure cook them. Um, and then just put, pickle a bunch of mushrooms. Either um, either pickle them or can them. And we, if we can them, I'm going to can them with like garlic and fat and oil and just pack them like that. So, um, But I love pickled mushrooms. Pickled mushrooms are so good. I forgot what it's called. There's a, a mix of vegetables when you have, like, carrots and... Um, bimbap? No, uh, though I love bimbap. But, no, I'm talking about a pickled oh, food. Gotcha. Um starts with a G, like a G-H or something. But it's like uh, carrots and... What's the white broccoli? <laughs> Cauliflower. <laughs> Cauliflower. Did uh, you forget? <laughs> oh, look at these. These are little trees. Oh, no, this one's dead. <laughs> Do you remember that? No. That's Parks and Recreation. These people are at the farmer's market. Oh. And she picks up broccoli. She's like, oh, look, these little trees. And then she picked up the, white, the cauliflower. She's like, oh, this one's dead. <laughs> oh. um, anyways, it's whatever that, that vegetable mix is, we made something very, very similar, but then slipped in a bunch of mushrooms, like uh, oyster mushroom caps. and Oh, it's so good. Uh, think you could cross BPK to Orangu or uh, given of its supposed origin. I don't know. I've not had really good luck uh, breeding viable strains of... I've bred new strains of BPK, but nothing that I can get to fruit. It's always when I bring them to the fruiting stage. I can. I feel like it's uh, 
an infertile hybrid or something. So I'm not sure. There have been other people who have claimed that they have um, and even published some work. I haven't really looked too closely into it yet, though, but I need to. What do you think of using the slant tubes to store myceliated LC for a mother culture and longer storage? I, I we rather just store them in the syringe. Um, if I'm going to store own liquid culture, I, I like to store it in a syringe. Just like you saw, just capped off. Though it can make it a little hard to depress. As you saw. I just invested in a laminar flow hood. If anyone is just starting out, I wish I would have bought this when I first started. I have thrown so much grain in liquid cultures away. Yeah, laminar flow is the way to go. Um, steel air boxes will work. But really what I would do is I would use a steel air box to get the money to like make enough money to get a laminar flow hood as fast as I can. I cut the big ones into long sticks like noodles. Mm, oh yeah, Samantha's over there dicing up kings right now. I guess for supper or something. Or <laughs> well, I was we were talking about all the ways that you can cut them, and so I was like, okay, well you can go sideways and you can do little steaks with them. <laughs> like a little yeah. I, oh my gosh, I love a right? king steak. <laughs> I think that's attractive. Little little uh, fish sauce and a little vinegar. Yeah. And then uh, deglaze the pan and then run that glaze over the the king steaks. Mm. Or you can do, like, scallions, right? Whereas these little circles. Scallops. Scallops. Scallions. That's hey, no, it's uh, fine. Onions. We're just, neither one of us can word tonight. <laughs> I didn't. I forgot but, the name for cauliflower. Yeah, so. and fry these on both sides or, or deep fry them and crisp them up. Or you could do like extra, Ooh. extra, extra thin and do Chris Kennedy trips. just said king sticks or lasagna noodles. Like you could cut them up into the layers for lasagna. Yeah. And then this is the, this is the cap. And these are, you know, fun. <laughs> so I just cut the, I just cut the cap in little slices. So these could be the mock noodles, especially if you have like sensitivities to flour or, or whatever else i'd really go good in like a hot and sour yeah. soup or a hot drop soup or something Mhm. Mm but at i don't know i just feel like kings have such a nice texture to them they're one of my favorites and they're really just like a two maybe three season crop for us we really don't we can't grow them except in the winter and and maybe early spring late fall it's got to get cold for us same for anoki for us how many strays of pinks do we have at the moment uh, one, two, three, four, five. I have five strains. Two native Australian pinks. Or unless it's the same Australian pink. I'll have to look at that. That may be one strain with two dishes. Uh, two, like a, um, uh, two different species of pink that I've got from commercial sources here. And then another one sent to me from Southeast Asia. Uh, let's see. What do I think of using wild bird seed with uh, millworms as grain? Yeah, uh, I I don't know about that. I would just use wild bird seed without the mealworms, if you can. When we first started, we used uh, wild, bird, wild seed. bird seed was the it was the thing. Like everybody like, used yeah. it, yeah. Which I actually really like the way the mycelium grows over black oil sunflower seeds. A lot of people hate it, but Oh, it always they always did really really well for us. Hey, some days on. <laughs> Hi, Cameron. <laughs> hey, Cameron. Where do you see that at? Down at the bottom. <laughs> nope, I don't have that. You're frozen again. It must be. Uh, have you tried breeding King Blue to Orangi? Oh, yeah, Jacob already answered that. My bad. Uh, not really. I haven't tried that mix. That mix would, might be good. In fact. What would be really interesting is try to breed it to an Ostriatus and then try to breed it to an Orangi. Oh. But, but again, it's it's not really, I don't know, there's been a lot more information that's come out about Black, black Pearl. Um, it may be that it was a hybrid between a rarer oyster um, and it may not be an Ostriatus at all. Um, one of the big problems is without DNA testing, there's so much that we don't know about the mushrooms that... Um, like species, there's, there's turning out to be a lot more oyster species than we thought, and it seems like there's maybe more herisium species than what we thought. Or herisium has got a larger, wider genetic variance than we thought, so. 
oh, hey, hey, it's Cameron. Someday I'm just too lazy to switch to my YouTube account. Gotcha, okay. That's what I was saying. That's why. <laughs> now you see it. I also, just had to read it. So, oh, kimchi. Oh, kimchi sounds good, but I don't know if mushrooms would do well in a kimchi mix. I tried to koji mushrooms, and I should have added a lot more, more rice. It was pretty foul by the fifth day. I had to throw it away. It smelled like garbage. <laughs> like hot garbage <laughs> on a summer you, day. At least you tried. I did can, try. Can it koji? <laughs> will can it, it koji? Will it koji? <laughs> well, mushrooms koji. Probably. <laughs> um, bioprospecting. Is there anything dangerous or concerning about bioprospecting for lab or farm? So, I, I, would, I don't know about dangerous. I think probably not much... The the worst thing um, might be the collection of invasive species. I don't know how much we really have to worry about that since spores travel such great distances anyways. And I feel like mushrooms are mostly in the habitats they're going to be in. With climate change, that could change, but then that would change on its own. Um, we might speed it up a little bit. There is something to be said about perhaps... If you're growing a lot of it, tons and tons and tons of the things, you're producing billions and billions and billions and untold billions of spores um, and slinging them out in the environment, maybe. But as far as just like bioprospecting, collecting the diversity, growing it a few times, I don't think that there's much danger in that. Um, again, that's assuming that you're not collecting plant pathogens. Um, if you start collecting plant pathogens, you may have to have a Category 4 lab. Um, and you'll have to be inspected and certified for that. Uh, do, 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 uh, try adding white wine to the mushrooms, garlic, oils, herbs, and veggies. Absolutely. Man, I'm right there with you. I add mead a lot, so... I can't wait for spring and summer when we can... Start growing our herbs again. Oh my gosh, I'm totally going to do pickled peppers and mushrooms. And mm. Oh man, lemon, lemon thyme. That is some of the other variegated thymes too. Like, they smell so good. <laughs> uh, Alright guys, we're going to check out a quick sponsor. I need a drink of water. Introducing the future of mycology. Dr. Silurian's Elixir of Mycelial Mastery. This isn't your average culture mix. It's a revolution in a packet, crafted for the dedicated cultivator seeking unparalleled growth. Experience the visual alchemy of this masterful brew. As you mix 10 grams with 500 milliliters of water, watch the solution transform into a rich amber spectacle the hallmark of a nutrient-dense sanctuary for your burgeoning mycelium. This is where vibrant color meets vibrant life, setting our elixir apart from the ordinary clear liquid cultures. Prepare to be captivated. Mix 10 grams of Dr. Silurian's elixir with 500 milliliters of water, add a stir bar for thorough integration, and sterilize the blend at 15 PSI for 45 minutes. Once cooled, Introduce your favorite culture into this perfectly prepared, nutrient-rich environment. Watch in awe as the elixir works its magic, unveiling a mycelial masterpiece before your eyes. Choose Dr. Silurian's Elixir of Mycelial Mastery for a mycological adventure that's as visually enchanting as it is potent. Hey, hey, we're back. Oh, wrong camera. There we are. Um... <laughs> Got Samantha's absorbed face. Oh yeah. <laughs> You're just staring blankly at the computer. <laughs> My bad. Uh this is why you don't put me in charge. <laughs> but um <clears throat> So uh Catherine, um yeah, birdseed works great. It it works just fine. Um with the mealworms, I'd say it's gonna work just fine. I've I've fed Madagascar hissing cockroaches to oyster mushrooms and uh, mealworms and dubia roaches and all kinds of stuff and uh, they they definitely will eat insects just fine. So, um, birdseed is so much cheap. Oh, you realized that we were streaming, Cameron? <laughs> Funny. Uh, birdseed is so much cheaper than grain. That's actually not true, uh, Catherine. For the most part, probably th that's a consequence of where you're buying your grain. Um, 
if you got all a farmer's co-op or a tractor supply, you can get like a. I, I get my bags of whole oats for how much do we pay for a whole oats, Samantha? Whole oats, <clears throat> I think it's eighteen ninety nine. Okay, how much would we pay for a bag of wheat? A bag of wheat? Yeah. I couldn't tell you. I think it's about twelve bucks. Um, I know a bag of corn costs. Uh, eight dollars. Yeah, and then said oats in Florida are eighteen dollars fifty pounds. That's exactly what we pay. Yep. So, I mean, you know, it it, it it's it's if you buy it for a farmers buy it, then you can get it a lot cheaper. Sixty dollars, gracious, for a fifty, for for a 50 pound bag of oats where Catherine is, and that and that's another thing. Fifty to consider. a pound. Wait, wait, fifty. A fifty pound, pound oat. of oats for sixty bucks. Hmm. Unless PD stands for something else. No, I'm, it's pound. I'm sure. I yeah, I don't know. Where's the Victorian frog? He was he was in there. He was like the first thing on the, the commercial. That's Doctor. That's Doctor Salerian. <laughs> we're, we're a company with character, and and, and characters. characters. <laughs> so there, there's more characters to come. <laughs> oh yeah, and Jacob Charles will be pleased. Oh yeah. He, yeah, I actually he, didn't he, recognize his voice at first whenever Andrew first showed me. And I was like, wait, is that Charles? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. Um, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute. Hot air. I was experimenting with a little space heater in my grow rooms, and it definitely raised the temp. And the mushrooms grew faster, but it also dried them out, which was odd. Not sure why. Uh, I mean, it's... It, can, it can definitely dry it. Those electric heaters in particular dry the air out. So, um, so it's definitely a slightly sensual commercial. I love it. Yeah, Charles is good, right? <laughs> he's, he's got that uh, that smooth, buttery voice that I can't <laughs> even imitate. Radio voice. Yeah. Um, let's see. When he writes a book one day, he's definitely going to have to do oh, I've told him. the audio. Oh, yeah, I mean, he's working... He's working on a book right now, and I was telling him when he releases it, he's got to do the audio. Uh, He's got to be the... I I like it when the authors read theirs, even like like Neil Gaiman. I freaking love it when he voices his books. What is it? What what do we always listen to on road trips with the kids? Uh, Oh, Norse Mythology. Yeah, just plain old Norse Mythology with Neil Gaiman reading it off. And I love his the way he does like Loki's voice. It's all sniveling and just cowardly and shit. (laughs) But uh, I have looked on Tractor Supply, but they are like ten and twenty pound bags. Uh, I, I'm not sure where you're at, Catherine. You, you, there's got to be a cheaper source. Um, there's definitely got to be a cheaper source. It's a fifty pounds or sixty dollars for a fifty pound bag. Sounds like food oats. Sounds like human grade oats, not horse oats or something. So like we get triple cleaned horse oats for eighteen ninety nine a bag, or is, or is it seventeen ninety nine a bag? It's eighteen ninety nine a bag, right and I w- I would also put in there that you you can go to your local co op, you can go to you know Tractor Supply or anywhere else like that, but I would also have what you're purchasing. Um, I would have it tested, just kind of you know by an independent lab and just check it out and make sure it looks good and they're not using anything that they're not supposed to, anything that would affect your crop. Um, there's definitely been some Milo that we've come across where. It's had a, a fungicide in it, and nothing will grow on it at all. <laughs> so, I mean, it just, uh, it is what it is. So just check it out. Do your due diligence. You know, that's yeah. something that I advise. Dang, John. Uh, yeah, we've heard a few people don't get the notification. You might have to set an alarm on your phone. I mean, most weeks, other than last week, most weeks we're here at 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, you can also hit, there's a little bell icon. Like, even if you're subscribed to us, it won't send you notifications. You have to hit the bell. To, to get notified. Um, I promise I won't push notifications real hard. Uh, the only time I try to push them uh, is the ones that YouTube forces me to do um, and the <laughs> live stream. So, And then like when I say that, I mean, like if I post something, YouTube may do a push notification depending on how long it's been since you've been on YouTube or something. You really like the smell of those kings, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Leave me be. <laughs> I've stayed away from honey mushrooms and true hypsigus due to the parasitization them. factor. Think that's a fair or unfounded? Uh, after talking to a lot of experts, Preda, um, 
the only real thing that I've heard anyone raise any real concern about. Uh, so for one thing, honey mushrooms are not gigantic spore producers um, compared to a lot of other species. Um, the other side of that is that honey mushrooms are already pretty prevalent in the environment. And so if they're going to paras parasitize a tree, it's probably because that tree is going to be parasitized by something. And honey mushrooms are actually a, not really the worst parasite. Um, in fact, there's there's a study going on where they are um, inoculating like uh, chestnut American chestnut trees with honey mushrooms to give it a parasite, hoping that the parasite will fight off the chestnut blight that was killing all the chestnut trees off. Uh, I don't know how successful it's been, but I mean, obviously they're not so worried about the honey mushrooms creating a problem. Because, you know, they're like, well, the honey mushrooms will kill it off in its older age versus the blight will kill it off now. So it's kind of like in World War Z where uh, Brad Pitt injects himself. Oh, wait, hold on. That's a spoiler. Spoiler. I shouldn't spoiler. Spoiler. You got 10 seconds. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. He injects himself with a deadly disease so the zombies will leave him alone. Okay. Now, that's kind of like what they're trying to do with the parasites there. However, I think unless you're taking spent substrate and just, like, dumping mountains of honey mushroom blocks, spent blocks, in your local forest, you're probably not causing a problem. So, in fact, honey mushrooms are touted as one of the big stump uh, destroyers, right? They aggressively take away stumps. So if you want a stump gone out of your yard when you cut a tree down... A lot of times people are talking about like honey plugs would be the way to go because they're already a, a species that um, works at the interface between tree and ground, whereas oysters don't. Oysters are all tree. Um, well, for the most part, the honey mushroom already has capabilities, tool sets, whatever you want to say, the evolutionary skill set to survive right there with that much surface uh, contact with the ground. And we'll just gnaw through that wood like crazy. So, I, I don't have a problem with it. Yeah, the honeys are, honeys are really cool. Mainly because of some of the... Uh, if you guys don't know, go follow Everyman Bio on Instagram. Um, he just recently released some photos of honey mushrooms growing that were far more impressive than what I could show right here, right now. Um, but he was talking about the chemical constituents of honey mushrooms, like the, the, the interesting compounds they produce. They're incredibly useful mushrooms. So you should go check that out and see what you think there. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. I want some bomb mushroom jerky. Who has the best mushroom jerky, Samantha? We've tried so many sources. I've forgotten. Your your parents got us some for Christmas, right, from the company? And we tried it, and it was really good. Mushroom jerky? Yeah. I don't remember. My parents got some buffalo jerky. Uh, this was a couple of years ago, I think. Hmm. Because they're super thoughtful like that. You know, we'll, we'll delve into something that we're super curious about and interested in. <laughs> and then before you know it, we've got some sort of gift that correlates with it. <laughs> well, okay, I'll just tell my favorites then, since Samantha doesn't seem to remember hers. But, uh, so, Extraterrestrial Fungi has got really good mushroom jerky. I don't know if they sell it online. Um, I forgot the name of their company. Down in Louisiana. Oh, all caps. Blue with a bite. All caps. All caps. Yeah, They've that. Got that. Yes. Mushroom jerky. <laughs> They've got a like a Louisiana. How did I forget uh, that? Like I'm a, so sorry, Daisy. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah, that is awesome. That's actually one of my very favorites. That's one of the few mushroom jerkies that have a spice to it um, that I can actually take. And it it's really it's called Blue with a bite. I'm sure she yep. still sells it. In fact, she was saying that she cannot keep it in stock. So. Oh yeah. That blue with the bite is it was really good. so good. And then, uh, who was it that was making it out of herisium? That was Josiah, wasn't it? Yeah, that was Josiah. Yeah, that was that was extraterrestrial fungi. Theirs was and made Aaron. out of herisium. Yeah, and her Aaron. Don't forget Aaron. Oh, I don't, I don't forget Aaron. <laughs> I just I'm used to you know Josiah and I are you know we're we're bros. So, but uh, he just 
had a baby. He may not want me putting his personal information out there, but congratulations, Josiah, former co-host of the show. We'd like to have you back, you know. But um, theirs was made out of herisium, and that was so good because of the texture. It had a chewiness to it. It had a, te- a chewiness to it that no oyster mushroom one has ever come across. However, there's one other company I was trying to think of that came up and did a mentorship with us and then brought us some mushroom jerky that they were already making. And I cannot think of who that is. That's Daisy, right? No, Daisy sent us some after, right? No, she brought some in and And that gift basket. Yeah. Of uh, Louisiana goods. Mm Mm-hmm. Beignets, is that what they're called? The donut things? Yeah. Beignets, those are, yeah. Those are good. I don't know, Um, but we need to send a gift basket back of all the Tennessee things. (laughs) <laughs> we need to just have one for every mentorship that shows up. Like, here's some yes, moonshine. We Welcome here. Let's spend the first day getting drunk moonshine. together. Moonshine. <laughs> uh, I don't even drink hardly, guys. <laughs> like, this is a funny thing. <laughs> I I don't. I drink maybe once a month. Um, I think it's like a beer. John's asked, maybe. "How do you make mushroom jerky?" From what I understand, you cook it, boil it, marinate. Everybody's it, cook got it. different ways of doing it, and I'm not gonna. And then dehydrate it. Yeah, there's a lot of recipes online. Unfortunately. The best ones that I've had, they've told me how to do it, but asked me not how to sh- not to share it, and I'm not gonna break break that trust. Um, but I will say, well, what that they told you is not what I I didn't hear what they told you. So what I am what I am saying is what mm-hmm. I have found online, just on YouTube in yeah, general, uh, is is where they they boiled it, and marinated it, and then dehydrated it. Gotcha. Well, there you go. Maybe try it that way. Undone. Any reishi strains you want to send me to clone, I'll happily clone. If you clone them and send me strains, I'll happily trade you strain for strain. Um, I'm so interested in reishi and Florida genetics. Is Actually, man, Spanna, do you mind if I go to Florida for a couple of days? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go. Well, maybe we can both go. <laughs> I mean, we already know. Uh, we can could, we could stay down in Tampa. We got a place to put the, put the RV in Tampa. Undone, I don't know where you're at, but... Uh, I've got several, several friends and farms uh, set up down in uh, Florida. I I think we need to make a road trip. And this winter would be a good time to get away from here for a little bit. Uh, Just just a few days. And we could go down and watch a rocket launch, maybe. That'd be cool. That'd be super cool. Take the kids. But we're absolutely interested in reishi. Um, Reishi is one of our big ones that we've collected this summer. And we're going to continue collecting. Um, In fact... Hmm... Have we already broke the news about florist? I don't think so. Eh, I'll shut my mouth. You guys can... But hey, he's in Tampa, so he's right there near uh, near uh, Cactus Hat. Who, by the way, has like the best mushroom coffee in the world. I freaking hate mud water, and that rye stuff tastes like garbage. And mud water hurts my <laughs> stomach. But holy crap, the Lion's Bane coffee from Cactus Hat? Use code Mossy, you get 15% off? I think, yeah, fifteen percent off, and it's like amazing. So, it's my favorite coffee. Maybe other than pinion coffee, I do. I really like pinion coffee. My mom always buys. It's like a tradition. My mom gets me a bag of pinion coffee every Christmas. So, pinion pine. Is that the coffee that comes in the red bag? Yeah. I don't think anybody else in the family likes it. I like it. It's not the coffee that they feed to a chicken, right? And then it no, it and then we're not about the, no. That wasn't chickens. That was uh, civet cats. <laughs> civet cats. Yeah, the the civet cat poop coffee. Mm 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 mm. Nope. I am working Mm-mm. on uh, guys. I'm working on koji coffee right now, where I'm taking coffee, wetting it, and then putting koji spores to it, and then throwing it in the incubator. It's way too acidic, so I'm I'm having to uh, try to find a more of a neutral pH way or cut it with rice and i'm going okay rice coffee but what would be interesting is the rice really brings out the sweet floral notes so maybe i can get like a floral sweet like a pre-sweetened coffee i'm you can try we're gonna try it if it works it'll be my new coffee tradition because it takes like 24 hours for koji to maybe 48 you know Mm. but i totally i want a house coffee tradition it burns me up to have just drip coffee Right. I want, like, Turkish coffee, but for the Reed household. Right. We mushroom people, we end up growing mushroom coffee. 
hey, how about that? Take oyster mushrooms and grow them across coffee grounds and then just brew that. That'd probably be too fungal. Maybe Herisium. I'm not sure. We're going to work on this, guys. Um, yes, uh, Cameron, I have. We haven't been doing a lot of bioprospecting right now where it's mushroom season is just not around us that much. Uh, now that it's warmed back up after the snows, we are seeing some oysters. So... Uh, pretty soon I'll be probably putting a rig on my bike and then just biking around. I mean, we that's really what we do right now is, is hunt around here. But uh, I have thought about doing a TV show called Bio Prospectors or Prospectors, like a TV show, but on our YouTube channel. That's just our – would people actually watch that? Because if I did a traveling show where I was bioprospecting and – didn't have as much time for the cultivation stuff, but just literally showed my adventures with my family and I bioprospecting stuff. Is that something that would be interesting? If so, let me know. I would love to know. Sounds like Cameron's interested. Uh, ever tried algae culture in the sub bag for in bag fruiting? Uh, no, Jacob, but what I've wanted to do, and maybe someone else can do this, so hopefully if I put the word out there, somebody else will try this. I would love to take pellets put them in a bag, add water, but the water isn't just water, it is um, spirulina culture. Spirulina is grown at a higher pH um, and should be at the correct pH level and spirulina is high in protein and nitrogen, right? So if you grow a really thick spirulina culture and then use that to hydrate your blocks of just sawdust, I think you could get some good flushes off of that. I really want to try that. I just, every year I forget to start my algae culture, and by the time I remember it, it's winter time. So, someone said, oh, it's, <laughs> Eric said, come on, yes. <laughs> um, I remember now. You remember what? The um, mushroom jerky company that I was thinking of that was a uh, gift. Okay. So, we used to go over to Andrew's parents' house and watch uh, Shark Tank. Oh wow. yeah, almost every weekend. Remember, and then they had Pan's mushroom jerky on there, and they tried it and and decided to back him, and that was the mushroom jerky that we tried. Oh, I don't remember if I liked it. I liked it. <laughs> okay, well there you go. Samantha's not picky, but cho choosy. I am. That's You're okay. Choosy, yeah. I mean, it's, it's okay. all right. The hell yes on the bio prospecting, yes. Really interesting, Koji. What do you recommend for a beginner to inoculate with Koji? Rice. Rice is the number one thing. Um, you can squeeze it for drippings for the metabolites. That I mean, the amylases, um, which break down the carbohydrates and basically just turn them into sugars. It is so sweet. Um, but uh, and you can use those drippings to cook with or whatever. People make all kinds. Of, there's a book called Koji Alchemy. That they talk about from from cojing just rice to vegetables to fruits to meats and cheeses, so that's such a good good one to look at. Uh, koji is super easy to play with and grow, uh, especially if you're working on plant matter. If you start working with like meats and things, you have to be a little bit more careful. Uh, people koji eggs and egg yolks and stuff. I mean, it it gets people get wild with it. Yeah, egg yolks. This is his face. Yeah, and they get gummy. They apparently like little gummy egg yolks, but where, where the the koji is wonderful because koji does one of two things based on the temperature and what it comes across. So if it comes across carbohydrates, it produces amylases, which break down the carbohydrates into sugars, right? If it comes across proteins, it then produces uh, protolases, which then break the proteins down into amino acids. So soy sauce is made with the same koji mold. I mean, usually a different strain, but it's made with koji mold the same way sake is. And so, honestly, my favorite thing to do with it is to make sake and then to turn that into shochu, which is a distillate. But what? What is that face for? I'm impressed. Ah, I love it. <laughs> well, and it's crazy. It's an aspergillus fungus. Most aspergillus funguses are incredibly toxic to humans, but not this aspergillus. It's the, uh, basically, you just think the Asiatic sugar pathway. Um, 
whereas the European pathway tends to be more malting. The South America, the American development was um, where they use spit. They basically take corn, they chew it, and they spit it into a pot, and they let their spit break down the... Um, I forgot the name of the drink. But they, they make it, and when it ferments, then you drink that. I know it sounds gross, but the fermentation process makes it safe. Um, <laughs> the, it's continuing just, to make faces. <laughs> well, <laughs> right, yeah. Oh, All right, man. It, it is 10-12. You, you talking about malting makes me miss the creamery so bad, and their malt well, milkshake. I think Bibles still, Tinsley Bibles, I think they still have the malt milkshake bar. We should go there with the kiddos sometime. Unless, did they, they didn't close down in COVID, did they? Surely not. I don't think so. They had a pharmacy. It was a pharmacy and then a All my favorite places. <sighs> COVID killed so many things. Oy. Sorry, our reaction to COVID killed so many things. I'm sick of acting like COVID was a big fucking deal. It <laughs> wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> Andrew. I know we lost some people, and I feel very bad for that. Um, you know, I even lost people that I loved, but we lose people to flu too, and other things. Anyways, I guess before this man gets too mad at me for <laughs> voicing my political opinions, <laughs> not political, it's a biological opinion. Anyways, uh, I worked some oyster mushrooms on toilet paper, it tasted just like toilet paper. That sounds gross. Uh, let's see, what type, if fatty acid showed up, what type of grain spawn do you suggest for someone not experienced in cooking grain? Oats. Oats are always my suggestion for the grain spawn. Um, oats take abuse. Oats, oats, you can overhydrate oats and they won't be a problem. Um, it is just absolutely, oats are, are it. They're the most nutritious grain. They're the ones that promote the best mycelial growth that I've seen, the best leaping off. Oats are just superior in every way except surface area. Um, they don't have as many inoculation points, but that doesn't really matter. I mean, I guess, well, you can't see the bags from any camera angle, but we've got a crap ton of bags over here, and they're all growing in incredibly quick, uh, and they're all with oats. Or our oats and Milo blend, but we've been just using oats right now just because Milo's been getting hard to find uh, for a decent price. Milo is getting really hard to find. But, um, well, folks, I think we actually, we need to be calling it. I had one more sponsorship, but we've been having such a good time that I don't really feel like we got to, we got to push that. So, um, we were going to do a strain, uh, video, just a quick, uh, push in a strain for you guys. Deep Blue Sea. I'm, I'm not even going to play the commercial, um, but check out Deep Blue Sea. It is one of my, my new favorite strains. It's a release. It is a cross between Mother of Pearl and Rocky Top. Um, it is one of the few strains that I've seen that really keeps a good blue color into its maturity. Um, and, in fact, I would say that during the winter time, it kind of keeps more of an electric blue than, like, BS-26 does. BS-26 is, like, almost black right now with how blue it is. But... Uh, Deep Blue Sea is a really good producer, very vigorous, very strong, good good yield. Um, it's good quality oyster, and it's just absolutely gorgeous. So absolutely check it out if you guys are interested in a new strain to play with. Um, be watching out for those new Patreon tiers that we're pulling out. Again, we'll be deleting some, creating some new ones, and reshuffling them around. I'll make as many announcements about it as I can before I pull the trigger, but at some point, I've got to rearrange it. It's going to hurt me financially, I know. But it's going to get you guys a lot, lot cooler stuff. And stuff that we're just able to machine out versus the stuff that's been taking us a while to get out. So, um, with that, Samantha, so do you have anything you'd like to add before we head out? No. <laughs> Climatic. <laughs> um, <laughs> you remind me of that... Um, <laughs> Oh, uh, sorry, not S sorry. The SNL <laughs> skit with uh, Jimmy Fallon and Justin Timberlake, where they're the two singer brothers, and he's always like, one's really like, ah! and then the other, every time he's like, what about you, brother? Do you have anything to say? Uh, no. <laughs> like, All right, then. Well, 
Uh, let's see. One more thing before we go, since uh, Fatty Acids just showed up. Um, Mossy, I'm going to send you five oyster cultures to trade. Heck yeah. I just want to retain rights to sell those as a supplier and have you introduce those to your breeding programs. Keep bioprospecting. Keep it up. Absolutely. I usually don't if, if people trade something to me and they don't want me to sell it i won't sell it it'll go in the breeding program i do retain the rights to sell anything i developed through the breeding program using your stuff but i absolutely am happy to trade um and just bring that in to to get the genetics going through the program so yeah man just email me uh let me know what five cultures you want and we'll trade culture for culture uh, if you won't sell my stuff, please, uh, I, you know, again, I absolutely will respect you and, and not uh, sell your stuff. So, um, whoa, glitch. We're going all cyberpunk. <laughs> <laughs> all right, y'all. Had a great time with you. Um, thank you so much for Here joining us. And uh, remember, y'all, keep spawning culture. <laughs>